I've had this on my mind all week. And to be honest with you, God had actually laid some people on my heart. People in this church. I won't say why, I won't say who, I won't say what it was about. That's between me and the Lord. That's between them and the Lord. But this, this was the, the word that I kept thinking about from the Bible. And it's the word faithful. Now, in that word faithful is the word what? Faith. It starts out being faithful must start out with faith. Let me describe for you what that means. A lot of people in this world, they have a faith. They believe in some God of some kind. The Muslims, they believe, believe that Allah is their God. Allah is not God. And you know how I know? He's not, it's not the same God as our God. Our God had a son. And it is a curse in Islam to say that Allah did not have to say that Allah had a son. There is a, a gospel tract that is, that is, the title of it is, Allah had no son. And it's put out by Chick Publications. Uh, you know, those are the comic book type of gospel tracts. Well, Tim Barons, who just was here a couple months ago, uh, he went two different times up to St. Louis. The first time he went to a mosque. He walks in this mosque and sees everybody's got their shoes off, so he takes his shoes off. He goes into a mosque. And um, Lisa, I was telling um, Brother Salim that. He said, that he, could, he could get killed. I said, yeah, he, he knows that. Uh, I think I know Tim well enough to know that that's how he wants to die. But he went into this mosque, and he said there was about five or six men in there, and he handed them, personally, that gospel tract, Allah had no son. And it's written in Arabic. And he talked to him a little bit, and left, with his hide still on him. Then he went to some Muslim center, educational center or something like that, and um, he can't get in, but he's in the parking lot, and he's putting gospel tracts, he's putting Allah had no son on the cars there, on the windshield of the cars. Well, a security guy comes over. Tim, he thinks fast. So he handed the rest of the tracks to the security guy and said, would you finish this for me? Just put one on every car for me. Now he's back out in Las Vegas. Um, when he lived out there, his goal was to give out 300 gospel tracts a day. Most of them got thrown in the trash. But he did it anyway. Why? Because there's that one. There's that one. And in Las Vegas, I've been out there. That one needs Jesus. Whoever that one is, that one needs Jesus. So he's out there again this week, and he did it again. He went to a, went to a mosque. Um, I don't know. I don't have my phone on me, or I read his text. But he wanted to thank everybody for praying for him. He's still alive. And he's coming back into the St. Louis area uh, Wednesday. Um, and so just continue to pray for him. But the tract basically teaches what Islam teaches, that Allah had no son. So therefore... The God Allah cannot be the same God as the Christian God because our God had a son. His name was Jesus Christ. And that's who we believe in. So the word faithful starts out with faith. You must believe in something. And if you don't believe in what you're doing, my question is, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? There's not a lot of atheists that come to our church. 
You know why? Because they don't believe in God. They don't believe in what we believe in. They, to us, it, to them, it, makes, it doesn't make any sense. There's no reason behind it. They can't see God in a telescope or a microscope. So therefore, God doesn't exist. But which one of us can go out here to the yard of the church and look at the grass and the trees and the sky and see God there, 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 there. He's everywhere. Amen? It's because we believe in Him. So being faithful starts out with faith, but it is different than just believing in something. Probably most of the state of Missouri, if, I were to, if you were to go around and ask people, do you believe there's a God in heaven? Yes. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Most, probably most people would say yes. But does that mean that because they believe those two things, does that mean that they are going to heaven? No. Because Jesus said it this way. He said, the devils also believe and tremble. So the devils, I mean, when Jesus was with somebody who was possessed of devils, what happened? They would start shaking and trembling. Why? Because they knew who Jesus was and they were afraid of him. One of them said, what have we to do with thee, thou son of the most high God? They knew who he was. And Jesus cast them out. They were afraid of him because they knew his authority and his power. And he exhibited it to them right there on that day. So to just say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. That's good, but that's not all there is. There is the issue of what's called faithfulness. Now I'm going to read these verses that I have up on the screen. If you want to follow along with me, you can. Um, notice the use of the word in the Bible. Numbers 12, 7. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. Now I want you to think about, this is God saying this. And there's a little feud going on here about who's going to be in charge of the Israelites. And he says, my servant Moses is not like you guys. My servant Moses is faithful in all mine house. And I want you to think about what God means when he says that about Moses. Does God just simply mean that Moses believes in God? Is that the end of it? No. There's more to it than that. 1 Samuel 26, verse 23. The Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his, here's the word, faithfulness. Again, I, we are not saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. We've already broken them. We're already doomed because we have failed to keep God's commandments. But yet God has provided a way for all of us that if we want to, we can abide with him in heaven forever and not have to suffer the penalty that God has for our sins. So, but in this case, he said, the Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. And is God simply referring to what he believes? No. He's going past that. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. That was David saying that. 1 Corinthians 4, 2. This is the Apostle Paul. Moreover, it is required in stewards. And ask yourself, what is a steward? That a man be found faithful. What is a steward? We, we would use the word, let's say we would use the word personal assistant, butler, personal aid, uh, you know, people with a lot of money and who run big businesses or they're big in politics, they will have personal aides that will do all of the mundane things that they just don't have time to do because they're busy running big companies or they're busy with politics or they're busy counting their money or whatever it is they're doing. They will have people that they will put in charge. Mo Donald Trump does not know how much money he has in the bank. Does he? 
I, I wouldn't think he does. I'm pretty sure that Trump doesn't sit at, with his checkbook every day going, what was that check for? $1.8 million, who spent that? What was that for? I don't think he does that. I think that he's got somebody hired that handles his finances. And when you handle the finances of Donald Trump, you can't just be anybody. You have to be trusted. Because you have authority, legal authority, to sign your name on checks and give that money out to different people and to distribute his money with whatever need, his needs are, whatever his company's needs are, whatever. You have the authority over the money. When Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers and he ended up in the house of a man by the name of Potiphar, who was sort of the military commander in charge of the Egyptian armies, the Bible says that Potiphar didn't even know what he owned except the, the plate of food that he had in front of him and the bed that he slept in. But he was a very wealthy man. Who did he give charge over all of his fortune? His lambs, his, his cattle, his tents, his servants. Who did he give it charge to? He gave it to Joseph. Joseph knew how many cattle he had. Joseph knew how much money he had. Joseph knew how many acres of land he owned and how many servants he had. Joseph was faithful in all of that. And so when Potiphar's wife came to him, good-looking Joseph, wanting to, him to sleep with her, he said, my Lord has put me in charge of everything in his house, and he trusts me. Do you think I'm going to violate that by sleeping with my, my boss's wife? You're crazy. And he left, but she took his coat. And lied about him and said that he tried to force himself on it, which was a lie. Joseph ended up in prison for it. Potiphar, in his mind, thought he had a man he could trust. That's what a steward is. In this verse, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And I want you to ask yourself, what are we stewards of? What has God given to us? that not only requires our faith, but it requires our faithfulness. I can show you one thing. The Bible. God has given us His Word in the form of these 66 books written by 40 men over a period of some 4,000 years. God has given us His Word to keep and to hold on to it, to not sell it off, to not trade it in, to not um, walk away from it, to not change it to suit what we want. Which happens a lot nowadays. People read something in the Bible they don't like, they change it. I don't like that, so I'm going to change it. And so now we have churches all over this country that are full of rot and corruption and all kinds of sins that are being excused now because some man or some woman didn't like what they read in the Bible, so they changed it. That steward is an unfaithful steward. Of what God has given them. How many would you say amen to that? God has given me a wife. I am, in that sense, I am a steward over her. God has given her to me to be her husband, to love her, to honor her, to keep her. I mean, I made an oath in front of this church in 1987 that I would love her, honor her, keep her in sickness and in health until death do us part. I made that promise in front of everybody. 
And I have a responsibility to my wife to love her, to honor her, to keep her, and not run out on her as long as I'm alive. Does that make sense? You know what that's called? Faithful. It's called faithful. We have, in this country, we have a serious, faithful problem in marriage, don't we? Serious problem. Husbands running out on their wives, wives running out on their husbands. A man who used to be part of our church years ago, Brother Joe Pogue, he was pastoring a church down south. His wife left him to be a lesbian. Was she faithful? He, he was. She wasn't. So you get where I'm going with this? Bub, tell him I'll call him back as soon as church is over, okay? Uh, let's go to prayer. Father... Lord, help me to preach this message. Lord, I am aware that I am just as guilty as everybody else is when it comes to the issue of being faithful. And I pray to your God, Lord, that you would just, you would preach this to me first so that I could preach it to these people. And I pray, dear God, that you would stir our hearts with what's right and how to do what's right and be what's right and how to be faithful because you've been faithful to us. You've never left us. You've never forsaken us. You've never turned us away. You've always accepted. You've always heard every prayer we've ever prayed. And you've always loved us and you always will. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless this message. Bless your people today, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said. Now, turn the Bible to the book of James, chapter 2, if you would. Here's the, in, in my opinion, this is the definition of faithfulness. And this, to me, there's, I, know, I know some people who have a serious doctrinal issue with James, chapter 2. And I don't have that issue. I, I understand it. As I mentioned before, we don't have atheists that come into our church. I got a new fan too, by the way. So if you see me lift up about three inches off this floor here, it's that fan. Um, but James chapter 2 describes the role of a Christian in Christianity. And again, you can believe in God and believe in the person of Jesus Christ, but not trust Him and not be faithful to Him. And therein lies the difference. And James is going to spell that out to us. And he says in verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now what he's talking about is the evidence that he really does believe what he says he believes. So, forgive me if anybody here or anybody online is a used car salesman, but I'm going to use this analogy. Sometimes used car salesmen are notorious about not being forthright and honest about the car they're trying to pawn off on you. Sometimes they're known for that. Not all of them, but sometimes they are. And so they would say, oh, this is the car you need right here. Boy, I got a sweet deal on this one, man. I tell you what, and I could offer you a pretty good discount because I got a sweet buy on this one. I mean, this thing runs. This, is, uh, this, this was owned by a little old lady in Pasadena. And on and on. And they tell you all oh, this car. and boy, they, boy, it's really something. What if it's that great? Why don't you drive it home? If you really believe that this car is really something to hold on to and something to have, 
then why didn't you drive it home? Why do you want me to do it? Why don't you take it off and, and run it for a month and then come back and if it's still running, I'll buy it off of you. Try that one on if you ever deal with a used car salesman. Try that one. Say, I tell you what, you drive it this next month, I'll pay the payment on it, and if it still runs next month, I'll buy it off of you. Let's see how many you get taking up that offer. That's what he's talking about. If the man really believed that the car was worth something, it would be worth something. And it would be known. He said, verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? That's how God moved in my heart when I felt like we needed to feed people. I didn't know who at the time. And I was talking it over with Michael, my son-in-law, and he said that he had talked to his cousin, who is one of the managers over our radio stations in Kenya, and said that there are people in Turkana that are dying and starving to death every day up there. And God broke my heart over that. Now that I know that those people are up there hungry and dying and I have the means and the ability to do something about it and I don't do something about it, am I guilty? Yes. I'm guilty. I would, be, I would say to them, oh, I'll pray for you which is a con man's phrase of, I'm not going to do anything about it. To be faithful, to actually show that you have faith, would be to get involved and send some money over so that somebody can buy some food and give it out to some people free of charge and not even ask them to come to church next Sunday, just do it. That's faithfulness. And that's why I believe God has blessed our church the way he has blessed our church. Because God showed us the responsibility and he's given us the stewardship of these people who are listening right now in Kenya. He has handed over stewardship of their lives, their souls, and in some cases, their hunger needs. He's handed that to us and he said, I trust that you'll do the right thing with this. And if we don't do the right thing, I think God will stop blessing us. Look at verse 7 or 17. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So, look at it this way. You tell people that you're a Christian. You tell your neighbors that. You tell the people you work with that. You tell the people at the gas station you trade at every week. You tell them that. You tell them that, and I guarantee you, from that moment forward, those people are going to watch your life. And come Sunday morning, when they expect you to pull in to get your soda pop in church clothes, you got your flip-flops and your shorts on, and you're going to go out fishing... You're going to go out camping. You're going to go out hunting. They see you do that three or four weekends in a row. You haven't been to church in a month. That you're, not, you're a joke to them. You say you're a Christian. And yet you don't even... Where, where do you go to church? What church? Who's the pastor there at that church? What did he preach on last Sunday? Don't be surprised people do that to you. Because they think most Christians are a joke anyway. And to be honest with you, a lot of them are. Why? 
Because it's this issue of faithfulness. They will not be faithful to God. They will not be faithful to, in prayer. They will not be faithful in studying the scriptures. They will not be faithful in church. And the world sees it. And you tell them that. Let me read that verse again. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. In other words, I will prove to you in my daily life that I am who I said I was. Verse 19, thou believest, look at this, look at this. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. And what he's really saying there is, you don't really believe what you say you believe. You say you trust in God, but the actions of your life show that you don't really trust God. You trust everything else, you trust this world, you trust yourself, but you don't trust God. When Israel... When they had finally left, this is what Ron and Sandy and I were talking about before church. When Israel finally got the permission to leave Egypt, after Pharaoh's firstborn son, after he found him dead, Pharaoh finally said, get these Jews out of here. Leave! So Moses said, let's pack up, let's go, let's go, let's go. They all left and they wandered in the wilderness and God made them, instead of taking the easy way right into Canaan land, I mean, they could just gone up the shore of the Mediterranean and found Israel, found the land, they would have been, would have, would have been there already. Would, would have taken probably a month and they would have been there. But God made them go to the Red Sea and camp out there along the bank of the Red Sea. And they had to go through a mountain pass. There's one way in there and there's one way out. And then God, the Bible says that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, what was, I, what was I doing? Why did I let him go? I'm going to go out and kill him. So he takes his army and he goes right over to that mountain pass. And, and God stops him there. And they, the Jews, they see Pharaoh on this side. They see the Red Sea on that side. And they're going, where are we going to go? What have we got? We, we need deliverance. Did, did God just drag us out here to die? Listen. The Jews are not the only people in the world who've ever said that. I've said that before. God, surely you didn't drag me out this far only to let me go, did you? I found out God didn't just drag me out so far to let me go. God forced them into a position where they had to trust God because they had no other choice. I mean, who are you going to go to when you find out you've got cancer? I'm not saying it's wrong to go to the doctors, and I'm not saying it's wrong to try to fight it with medicine. I'm not saying any of that's wrong. But ultimately, you're facing death. If I were you, I would go to God. Because whether you live past that cancer experience or don't one day you're going to be standing before God anyway and you're going to need him on your side that's faithfulness first Samuel 2 35 God said I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind and I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed Forever. In this case, he's prophesying of Jesus Christ, who is our high priest before God. Now, let me ask you a question. Does Jesus ever leave from being at the right hand of the Father? Does Jesus ever stop being our mediator between us and God? Does he take a week's vacation? Does he say, I'm tired of hearing all these prayers. I can't handle it today. I'm, I'm going to go fishing. Does he ever do that? See, Jesus is that faithful priest, is he not? Is he not faithful to you? I would ask you this question, how long has it been since you prayed? I mean, since you really prayed. 
When's the last time you spent time in prayer? When's the last time you spent time talking to God, telling Him your problems, telling Him your needs? When is the last time you did that? Because I guarantee you, God knows when the last time it was because He was standing there waiting for you. He was being faithful even when you weren't. He was being faithful. And in this sense, God is looking for people that he can trust with his house, meaning his church. If you were to be put in charge of the money of this church, would you be faithful enough not to dip into it and, and steal some of it? Would you? Would you have to ask that yourself? I'm not asking you to raise your hand and say, Brother Mike, I want the job. Would you be faithful enough not to divulge outside of your own knowledge who pays tithes and who doesn't? Would you be faithful to keep that to yourself? Would you be faithful handling not my money, not the church's money. That's God's money. The moment you put it in that plate, that, that, that doesn't belong to me, it don't belong to you, it belongs to God. Could you be counted as being faithful enough to be in charge of that and not take a dime of it? What about his house? Can you, could you be faithful enough to support your church with your tithes, with your offerings, with your prayers, with your knowledge of the word of God so that if, if let's say that I've, I was gone some Sunday and I called in some preacher and I thought I knew him and he started preaching some false doctrine from this pulpit. Would you know the word of God enough to know whether or not he was right? It's happened before, hasn't it? God's looking up to find some faithful people that will do according to what is in God's mind and God's heart, not theirs. That will be responsible for his house. Second Kings 12, 15. Moreover, they reckon not with the men into whose hand. Watch this. Uh, here again. I didn't mean to be preaching about money. How many times do I... We have visitors here. How many times do I preach about money? Let them know because I just don't do it. But it just came up in the notes. Moreover, they reckon not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be bestowed on workmen. For they dealt faithfully. In other words... They didn't have to count every dime and every shekel of the money that went to the workmen's hands that were helping to rebuild the wall and rebuild the temple. Because the men who were doling out the money were faithful men and they knew that it wasn't their money. They knew it was God's money and they were going to be faithful to God. See, if you really believed in the God that you say you believe, you wouldn't have a problem doing it for Him, would you? I mentioned, I, earlier I mentioned Donald Trump. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I voted for him. I didn't agree with everything the man said. But most of what he did as president, I was behind him 100%. 100%. And see, a man like that, I, I had it in my mind when he ran for president that he wasn't getting in this to get rich, was he? He already was. He wasn't in this to get power. He already had it. He was in this to try to save and fix things that are wrong in this country. And I didn't agree with everything that he said and did. But on the things that I agreed with, I'm right behind you 100%, Mr. President. And you don't have to force me to vote for you again. I'll do it again. YouTube's going to throw me out for this one. I guarantee you that. In, second, in, in, in the same book, 2 Kings 22, 7, Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand, because they dealt faithfully. 2 Chronicles 19, 9, He charged them, saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart. See, here's why... I believe in faithfulness so much. I've been on God's bad side before. Even as a minister. 
I've been on God's bad side before. And God put the fear of God in me. Just like my mama did. Put the fear of God in me. And I've been whooped by God. I've been chastened and chastised by God for things that were wrong in my life. And God corrected me over it. And God then gave me a different heart so that I don't do things anymore, not because I'm afraid to. I don't do it anymore because I love my God. A man or a woman, life happens. Sometimes they get caught up in an affair, caught up in adultery. They don't have to split up because of, the, because of that. Sometimes they just need to learn a lesson. Once they learn the lesson and they get another chance, they become faithful. Because they've seen the pain and the sorrow that their sin caused their family, their friends. And they said, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to, I'm going to be right because it's the right thing to do. Can I hear you say amen? Second Chronicles 31, 12. They brought in the offerings and the tithes and dedicated things faithfully over which Conaniah the Levite was ruler and Shimeiah's brother was the next. I'm not going to say any more on that. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9. Thou art the Lord, the God who didst choose Abram and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees and gavest him the name of Abraham and foundest his heart faithful before thee. Now what, what act did God tell Abraham to do? Offer up his son Isaac. Did Abraham do that? He did it. And God blessed him. God blessed him with the entire realm of the, of the underworld that we call in the Bible Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort for those who before Christ lived and died faithful lives to God. They were in a place of comfort until Christ came. God blessed Abraham with a name. Three made, the three major religions in this world, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, refer to Abraham as their father. That's how much God blessed this one man, Abraham, because God knew he was, didn't just believe in God, he acted on his faith and was faithful to God. When God said, do this, he did it. Psalm 31, 23. Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth who? I believe in preservation. When it comes to salvation, I believe in preservation. I also believe in perseverance. Preservation is what God does when he holds on to me, when I can't hold on myself. Amen? You were testifying, sister, about how the battle, the battle that you deal with. Thank you for your honesty. Because many people fight that same battle about getting in God's house and, getting, and worshiping God and serving him. They fight that same battle. And it's good to know for somebody else out there who might be struggling with the same thing that somebody else fights this battle too. And if God can help them, maybe God can help me too. See, this is why I don't, I don't mind you standing up in this place, any, you or anybody else in this place and saying, I'm having some problems in my life. I mean, I mean I'm some big problems. And I don't know what to do. I mean, I've, I've gotten off into sin. I've, I just don't, I can't stop. I just, I need help. This is the, this is the hospital right here. God preserves the faithful. Those who say they believe him 
and those who act upon that belief by doing these simple things that we do. Pray, read the Bible, come to church, love your neighbor, things like that. Lamentations 3.20, oh, I like this verse. How many of you ever made God mad one day and the next day God was over it? Look at this verse. Look at this. In fact, open up your Bible, Lamentations 3. Underlo you're going to need this verse one of these days. I guarantee you, you're going to need this verse. Lamentations 3.22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Consider the fact that you're not in hell right now. And you could be. I could be. And it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not already in hell right now. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So, Matthew, you made God mad one day. God got over it the next morning. And a lot of times, your dad, when I get up in the morning, I sit on the edge of the bed, and, if, and before I get up, I, I stop just for a minute. And I'll say, God, today's a new day. Let's have a better one than yesterday. Because I didn't do so hot yesterday. But I ask for your mercy and your forgiveness. And I know your mercy is new every morning. That's God being faithful to us. Husbands, let me help you with something. That will help your marriage. About being a faithful husband. Your wife is not just looking for a guy that won't cheat on her. She's looking for a man that she can look up to. A man that's going to lead her into God's grace every day. A man that is going to love his wife unconditionally. And even if she made him mad yesterday, by the next morning he's over it. And he's not, he's not upset with his wife. That was yesterday. It's all done. Don't worry about it. Today's a new day. That's good, isn't it? That's good stuff. That's God telling us men how to be. Telling us to do the right thing. And love your wife even on the days when she's not very lovable. You love her anyway. Ladies, the same thing would apply to you, but I'm not going to preach to you. I'm too scared. <clears throat> nah. <laughs> it goes both ways, doesn't it? You wives, you forgive your husbands. Have new mercy every day. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 40, verse 10, he said, I've not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I've declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. That is a person who understands that God is faithful to us. And so I'm going to be faithful enough to not hide the fact of what I am. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean or anything like that. But everybody turn around and look at Sister Mama Michael back there. Mama Michael, how you doing? I love you. <clears throat> you know, when she left Kenya and came to America, the black didn't fall off of her. Right? She's still black. When I w went from America to Kenya, I didn't start growing black. 
she is still the same woman she was when she left Kenya and came here to America to be with her son. We've enjoyed her presence here. But she's, what, here's, I'm making the analogy. She is that way everywhere she goes. And see, this is what the Bible says. I think Solomon said this. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? And the answer is no. Can a leopard change his spots? No. So if you really are a true, born-again, Bible-believing Christian, then you are one wherever you go. You understand the analogy I'm making now? You don't stop being a Christian when you walk out the door of the church. In fact, that's when it really starts, is out there. I've got to move on. Psalm 101, Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. We are servants to God. God has seen, Brian, that you can be counted on for being faithful. In spite of the struggles, in spite of the mistakes, God, and this is something I had to deal with myself. In spite of my own troubles, in spite of my own mistakes, I had to realize God could still use me. But I had to be faithful. Mine eyes shall be upon... I already had that in there. He walketh in a perfect way. Proverbs eleven thirteen: A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. That's a, that's a verse for all you gossip people out there. I won't point fingers. I'll just tell everybody who you are after church. No, that's a gossip, isn't it? If somebody comes to you and says, I need somebody to tell this to. And they tell you something. And you go, oh my goodness. They really do need somebody that can keep their mouth shut. And you know... There's always somebody in a church that nobody goes to to tell secrets. Do you know why? It's because everybody in that church knows they can't keep a secret. Isaiah 121. Look at this. How is the faithful city? A city can be a nation. A city can be this church. Could this church ever fail and turn against God? Is it possible? Of course it is. How is the faithful city becoming harlot? What is a harlot? A harlot's a woman. She went out on her husband and sold herself. It was full of judgment. It righteousness lodged in it. But now murderers. At one time, you were faithful. But something happened. And now you're not anymore. You need a remedy. Psalm 119, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Look at your Bible. Next time you hear Kenneth Copeland tell you on TV that it's not God's will for you to be sick, say, you're a liar! You're a big fat... He's a billionaire, by the way. Billionaire! Liar! Billionaire preacher liar. Those words just don't go together. Look at this. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I've had to go, I've had to go to people that I love to sit down with them and say, I gotta tell you something and I, I don't wanna hurt your feelings. But I've got, I've gotta tell you there's something going wrong. There's something wrong in your life. I've noticed it. I've seen it. I don't, I don't want you to be angry with me. I don't want you to be upset with me. But this has gotta change. You know how hard that is for me. I don't like doing that. But if I really love you, and I really care about you. I'm going to come to you. And I'm going to say, I need to talk to you. I don't want you to be mad at me. Because I want to be faithful to you. But I, this has got to stop. You know, I've had people do that to me. Come to me and tell me things. 
that I needed to stop? I've had people come to me and do that. How hard do you think that was for somebody to do that? But they were being faithful. They were being faithful. I thank God for people that will be faithful. I don't want you to be faithful to me. Faithful to God. You serve Him, and everything else falls into place, doesn't it? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning. I want to give you some time to pray. You can pray where you are. You can come down to one of these benches down here and pray. It doesn't matter. God doesn't need you in a particular geolocation to hear your prayer. But there are things that I have to preach from this pulpit that I don't want to preach to you because I know you're guilty of it. I've just been trying to be faithful to you and to be faithful to God. It is my job. It's my job to tell you what's wrong. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. God is faithful to afflict me. That's how he changes me. Maybe you're going through some of that affliction now. Maybe you're feeling the wounds of Jesus who is being your friend today. And he's wounded you. He's hurt your feelings. But he had to because you're full of pride. And you didn't want to hear it. But God dealt with you. And instead of being mad at the messenger... Turn that anger on your pride and say to yourself, it, it's my foolish, stupid pride that keeps me in sin. One of the hardest things to do in life, Brother Roy back there will tell you, is to face up to the fact, as he did some 33 years ago, that he was an alcoholic. And he didn't want to live with himself. But God was faithful to him. And God has kept him away from the bottle for almost 33 years now. That's how faithful God is. God will do that for you too, if you let him. The Father, I come before you today. I thank you, Lord, for the message. I needed it. The, these words are not mine. I didn't write them. These are your words. And remind me, Father, that I need to be faithful. Faithful to my wife, my family. Faithful to this church. Faithful to the name of this church. So that this church and this community has not had their name drugged through the mud because of its preacher. And Father, I, I know somebody else probably needed it too. We needed to be reminded that there's a difference between saying I believe in God and living like we believe in God. Father, help us to be faithful. Help us to be wise and good servants. Stewards that we're not doing this for our own sake. We're doing this for, for your sake, for your kingdom's sake, for your name's sake. You're a God that I will follow until I die and then I'll follow you for eternity. You've been that good to me. And what I know about you, God, I know that you are the greatest of all gods. And this life is the greatest of all lives. 
And this way is the greatest way in the world. And this truth is the greatest truth. And there is no other truth but the word of God. And I will follow this and serve this the rest of my life. And then I'll serve it in eternity and do it for free because of what you've done for me. Father, just deal with hearts. Speak to people this morning as they call unto you and cry out unto you and say, God, help me that I can be faithful as a child of the living God. Bless your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Would you stand to your feet?